Hello everyone, and welcome to Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, the show where we take a magnifying glass to all those microscopic details of health that shape our day-to-day -day lives. I'm Ethan, your dedicated observer of the human condition. And I'm Alara, your sharp-tongued guide to all things natural health. I promise to keep you wide awake, even if we're talking about invisible particles in the air that try to ruin your day. Because apparently, the biggest threats to your health can be the ones you can't even see. Which is fantastic news for folks like me who always suspected the real conspiracies were invisible. I thought it was a poltergeist rummaging through my fridge at midnight, but no, it's just air pollution sneaking into our lungs. You've discovered your real nighttime nemesis, Ethan. Today, we're diving into a rather sobering truth. Over 99% of people live in areas that exceed the World Health Organization's air pollution guidelines. Which, frankly, sounds like just about everyone on the planet except maybe a lonely penguin in Antarctica. And that penguin is probably complaining about the tourists, too. The staggering part is that we're not just talking about smog you can see floating over big cities. We're dealing with something more subtle, more insidious. Fine particulate matter. Or PM2.5 for those who love obscure abbreviations. PM2.5, which, if you squint, looks like a license plate number from a sci-fi spaceship, is that teeny tiny stuff that can hitch a ride into your body and set up shop in your lungs, liver, and just about anywhere else it pleases. Forget a free ride to the next town, these little particles go on a grand tour of your bloodstream. There's also type 2 diabetes in the mix. A global assessment found that air pollution contributes to around 20% of type 2 diabetes cases. That's a big chunk, especially when you realize we're not simply talking about chain smokers or people living next to a busy freeway. We're talking about everyday low-dose exposure that piles up over time. Right. And if you think that's enough doom and gloom, let's talk about your liver. Because it's not always the tequila on Saturday night that's stressing it out. Chronic exposure to particulate matter can cause fatty liver disease. That's like the perfect trifecta. Dirty air, a battered liver, and an increased risk of diabetes. That means your body's main detox organ is being compromised by the very substance it's trying to detox from your system. We've basically thrown the poor liver into a losing tug-of-war match. Exactly. A 2025 study showed that mice exposed to what we'd consider low levels of traffic-derived pollution ended up with fatty liver disease, inflammation, and reduced glycogen storage in their livers. I can't imagine they were thrilled about it. Especially since nobody asked them. Hello, Mr. Mouse. How would you like to volunteer for some advanced pollution exposure? We humans aren't exactly known for letting them sign consent forms. But the takeaway is that these low levels reflect real-life human exposure, even places we assume are less polluted. It's like Mother Nature looking at us and saying, surprise, there's nowhere to run. This all begs the question. If we're basically living in a giant dust cloud of PM2.5, how does this specifically cause chaos inside us? You know, besides the general idea that it's just not good to inhale microscopic mystery particles? Scientists point to oxidative stress and inflammation. PM2.5 triggers a cascade of events, including an imbalance of free radicals. Then your body sends out an all-points bulletin to your immune system, basically lighting up sirens and calling in reinforcements. Chronic inflammation follows, and that can damage tissues like your liver. So the body's saying, we've got trouble. The immune cells run to the scene, the scene is everywhere, and eventually, we're just walking around in a permanent state of biological chaos. That might be the best summary of modern living I've heard. It's also not just the liver that's at stake. That same oxidative stress can create insulin resistance, which then leads to type 2 diabetes. And we already know that heart disease is in on this unwelcome party, too. So basically, every organ that relies on healthy blood flow and balanced chemical signals ends up battered. That includes the brain, I'd imagine. It's like an all-access pass for these pollutants to wreak havoc. Precisely. We can't ignore the fact that even subtle, everyday exposure is dangerous. You don't have to live next to a coal factory to be affected. If you have traffic outside, if you're near a busy road, if you have a neighbor who thinks barbecuing every day is a heroic pursuit, you can face chronic exposure. Now, for those out there who are thinking, surely I can't do anything about the air outside my window, you'd be mostly correct. We can't exactly hop onto a weather balloon and vacuum up the polluted sky. But we can take steps in our personal environments. That's the beauty of focusing on what we can control instead of spiraling into existential dread about global pollution. Let's talk about some ways to improve the situation indoors, because that's where we have at least some power. Yes, the fortress known as home. We can barricade ourselves inside, although I'm told the occasional trip to buy groceries is advisable. So step one might be, purify your indoor air. Right. Think beyond the standard flimsy filter in your HVAC system that's been caked with dust since 1992. High-quality air purifiers can capture fine particulates. Some use photocatalytic oxidation, Fancy term for UV light that breaks down pollutants. If you're not a scientist, you can just say, I have a machine that zaps the bad stuff. I like to imagine a cartoonish laser inside my air purifier, or perhaps a mini Jedi Knight with a lightsaber. PM 2.5, you have met your match. If that mental image helps you, go with it. 
Besides purifiers, we can also be cautious about the household items we use. Nothing says I love fresh air like using 20 different chemical cleaners and lighting them on fire with a scented candle. So basically, my dream of a pine-scented bleach festival should be canceled. Cancel it, ASAP. Synthetic fragrances, aerosols, aggressive chemical-based cleaners, they all degrade your indoor air quality. The environment we create inside can be worse than outside sometimes. If you want your place to smell nice, open a window or use something natural like essential oils, but with moderation. And please, no chemical cocktails that promise to eliminate every germ known to man. I'm starting to think we have an infatuation with annihilating all life forms under our kitchen sinks. Meanwhile, we're ignoring the fact we also have to breathe in that carnage. Ventilation, ironically, is one of the simplest and best ways to get fresh air in, even if the outside air isn't perfect. Regularly opening your windows for just a quarter of an hour can make a big difference. Sure, you might let in a little pollen or a noisy car horn, but you also let out the stale, contaminated indoor air. So, if it's a frosty winter morning and you suddenly open your windows, you can just tell your family you're on a quest for fresh oxygen and not trying to sabotage them with an arctic blast? Precisely. But a few minutes of fresh air can help. Though you might want to do it carefully in the peak of winter. We're not recommending you turn your living room into the next polar vortex. Now, one tip that's easy to overlook is filtering your water. When I think of water filtration, I mostly think of what I'm drinking. I don't think about showering or bathing in unfiltered water. That's the thing. Unchlorinated water is best, but municipal systems thrive on chlorination. Then we end up inhaling chlorine vapors every time we take a nice hot shower. So if you can get a whole house filtration system, that's great. But if not, at least put a filter on your shower head. A spa day minus the bleach fumes. What a revolutionary concept. And one that might reduce the risk of dizzy spells from inhaling all those random chemicals wafting off the tap water. In the end, it's those small steps that add up. No single purifier or filter is going to single-handedly fix the global air crisis. But if each of us can reduce our personal exposure by a fraction, that fraction might be the difference between healthy organs and a slow decline into metabolic dysfunction. Now, there's also the matter of choosing when and where we spend time outdoors. Maybe not jogging on a busy highway in the middle of rush hour, you know? Unless you want your lungs to read like a city traffic report, that's absolutely the case. Pay attention to local air quality indices. If you see it's high, maybe do your workout indoors. And if you must be out, choose quieter back roads or times of day when pollution tends to dip. Look at you, advocating for a cunning schedule. That's what I do to avoid lines at the grocery store. Go at 6 a.m. to skip the rush. Now, I can also avoid a pollution rush. You're basically a pioneer, Ethan. And it all underscores a broader point. Just because the problem is huge, doesn't mean we can't take personal measures. We can be mindful about the air inside our homes, the times we choose to be outside, and the chemicals we're needlessly using. Meanwhile, we can keep our livers happy by reducing all those hidden forms of stress. Because who would have thought that a swirl of fine particulate matter could sabotage your entire metabolic system? Especially when we usually think about the liver in terms of what we eat or drink. It turns out the environment sneaks in as a big factor. Your metabolic health is basically the sum of all those daily exposures. Exactly. And that includes how often we sit in traffic with our windows down, or how frequently we open that big bottle of conventional cleaning spray. It's all about the small decisions compounding over time. And as we've learned, some populations are more at risk like people with lower socioeconomic status or pre-existing conditions. Air pollution doesn't discriminate in terms of geographical boundaries, but it can certainly amplify existing health disparities. So for them, it's even more crucial to do what's possible within their means. Sometimes that's as basic as opening windows, avoiding strong chemical products, and maybe setting up a box fan with a HEPA filter as a budget-friendly purifier. Push for cleaner energy sources, better public transport, or green spaces in cities. Because yes, we can individually manage our home environments, but it's also good to tackle the root causes out there. Good point. If you see an opportunity to plant more trees or support cleaner initiatives, that's never a bad idea. Meanwhile, we keep the focus on small, immediate steps so we don't fall into despair. Precisely. We don't want to be the show that just gloomily reports 99% of us are doomed. Instead, we're saying, yes, the air might be a bit sketchy, but here's what you can do to outsmart it. Right, because it's not hopeless. You can protect your health and improve your environment. It's that personal empowerment piece that's often missing in the big, scary headlines. Absolutely. And remember, if these microscopic pollutants are running amok, we can turn the tables by building up our defenses. Purify the air, filter the water, keep the windows open when appropriate, and ditch the chemicals. Then maybe your liver won't have to live in a perpetual panic room. Yes, the poor liver. Overworked, underappreciated, constantly on the receiving end of everything we ingest or inhale. Let's give it a break, shall we? Indeed. Let's move forward with a practical game plan. Breathe easier, lessen our risk for metabolic breakdown, and maybe, just maybe, enjoy a clear day once in a while.
depending on the weather and local pollution reports. Though I'll admit, there's something almost comedic in hearing that you should open your windows to get fresh air, while also hearing that outside air is bad. But hey, it's about balancing the lesser evils, stale indoor toxins or a brief breeze that carries a bit of outside dust. We choose the lesser of two particulates. Plus, the difference is that when you open your windows for a short time, you let old toxins out. You might let some new ones in, but overall, you're circulating and reducing the indoor buildup that's harmful. And if your outside environment isn't as heavily polluted, that short burst of air can still refresh your home. There you have it, the comedic paradox of modern life. Sometimes you just have to open the window, even if the air outside isn't pristine, because it might still be better than the stale air indoors. Modern living is a riddle, and our bodies are trying their best to solve it every day. If we can help by reducing that hidden smog drifting in our living rooms, all the better. I like to picture my liver smiling whenever I open a window now, as if it's saying, finally, you're letting me catch a break. It might do a little happy dance, or at least wave a white flag indicating, we're still in the fight, but conditions are improving. Exactly. And that's a nice note to wrap up on, a hopeful sense that we're still in the fight. The world can feel overwhelming, but we can lighten the load on our body's cellular machinery through daily habits. Yes, and that's what Dr. Mercola's cellular wisdom is all about. Simple, practical steps that respect our biology and address these modern challenges. We're not sitting here creating utopias. We're tackling real issues. Well, Ilara, as usual, you've managed to turn a discussion about fine particulate matter into an enlightening conversation. I suppose that's your superpower, making the invisible visible and the complicated comprehensible. And thank you for your role as the helpful cynic, always ready to point out how invisible conspiracies might just be the dust swirling in our faces. Together, we keep things entertaining. Absolutely. We hope everyone out there finds this useful, or at the very least, amusing enough to keep from nodding off while inhaling all that PM 2.5. So remember, it's not about panicking. It's about small, consistent steps. Breathe a bit deeper, open a window, turn on that air purifier, maybe ditch the chemical-laden stuff in your home. Over time, your cells will thank you. And your liver especially will appreciate the break from all the covert warfare. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom. I'm Ethan, signing off with a gentle reminder. When life gets hazy, it might just be time to check your filters. And I'm Alara, reminding everyone to stay sharp, stay curious, and don't let the small stuff, literally, wreck your day. We'll catch you next time. Keep breathing, folks. Thanks for watching. Subscribe now and click the notification bell so you never miss an update. See you in the next video.